moral virtues, and we're in the second cardinal virtue for tonight. But before we do, I wanted to give uh, give you all the opportunity to address um, for there to be any questions. Um, and so, with from uh, the previous week, I think we had uh, offered the opportunity to submit questions. And so, if the moderator would read any. Uh, question and then give me time to respond and then we'll we'll start out with tonight's program. Okay, I did not hear anything. Did you read the question? Hmm, okay, so I'll hang up and answer that. So the question was, I think we mentioned last week that there um, within prudence is the understanding of spiritual acts of mercy and uh, corporal acts of mercy. And so the difference between a spiritual act and a corporal act is in the spiritual act, the focus is the soul, salvation of the soul. And in the corporal act, the focus is uh, the corpus, the body, uh, the flesh. And so our Lord was very clear in multiple times, multiple occasions to stress that the primacy, the primary concern or the, the first concern is the uh, spiritual works of mercy because the disposition of the eternal soul is more important than the temporal status uh, or conditions or circumstances of the flesh. And what we've seen is modernly, this has been a, there's been an inversion. There's been more <clears throat> focus on the corporal works of mercy, feeding, clothing, uh, that type thing. Um, but the, I'll give you the first three spiritual works of mercy. And this gives you an idea of where they're going. And so the first one is um, to, uh, to inform the ignorant. Uh, to, to educate the ignorant. And, and that's with regard to the gospel, to um, scripture, to our Lord, to the triune God, to profess and to share the faith. And so this understanding, um, and first of all, is the use of the word ignorant is very simple. It, it's a not knowing. Um, and so ignorance can be cured um, by the knowing, by, the, by revelation. And so your first uh, primary spiritual work and, and St. Thomas ranks them uh, in an order for a reason. And so what he says is that the, the first spiritual work of mercy um, is to, to instruct the ignorant, to share the tenets of our faith, to share the gospel message, to share uh, the mysteries of the triune God. And then the second one is to counsel the doubtful. And so this counseling of the doubtful builds up the, faith. And so you'll see that in the first three spiritual works of mercy, what we're, you're addressing is faith or the lack thereof. You're, you're trying to, to help cultivate the theologically infused virtue of faith. And so they are, uh, and then the third one is to admonish the sinner. Meaning once someone knows it's wrong and they understand that these things uh, lead them away from God <clears throat> and they, they, um, and, that, and they continue in habitual mortal sin or they continue in sin, then we're to admonish. This is a paternal correction that's called uh, about by, it's called from, from St. Paul. But what we often do modernly is we skip directly to number three without doing the first two. And so you must do the first two. Um, there's a longer discourse on the spiritual and corporal works of mercy in multiple places. Father, speak, Father Ripperger speaks about it. But I'll give you those three just to illustrate the point. So what is a spiritual work of mercy and how does one do it? Um, speak always and everywhere of the Christ, of the wonder that is our Lord, um, of the, the glory of the nativity, the magnificence of the epiphany, um, and, and be always aware um, of the opportunity to speak the language of virtue, which disposes the soul uh, to grace. And so that's an example of a spiritual work of mercy and how one can uh, pursue those spiritual works of mercy. So um, tonight we're going to go into the second um, 
cardinal virtue that follows. Uh, we did prudence last week. Tonight, we're going to go into temperance. Now, <clears throat> temperance is often misunderstood, but if you had your hand out and you listen to your talk, you'll find that temperance um, leads us into an area that is, uh, is not very well traveled or very often traveled um, with the modern, uh, modern man. So temperance, St. Thomas defines it is as the virtue that moderates attraction and desire for pleasure and provides balance in the use of created goods. So we see that in the virtues, there is a, there, there'll be both an intellectual and a will element. The will element is very strong here in, um, in temperance. And many of us think that Temperance is, is a moderation of action, uh, but it is not. We see here, and it's not solely limited to that. What we see here is in this definition, the virtue that moderates attraction and desire for pleasure. So what is pleasure? Pleasure is that physiological response, that physical response um, to something that is that we perceive as a good. Now, remember last week we talked about the ultimate good is God. And temperance is specifically about, provides balance in the use of created goods. So we're talking creatures, not creator. So that's your per first point of reference is the pleasure derived from the use of created goods. And so use is also, don't think totally utilitarian, but just the association with created goods. And it has to be done in moderation. But it's all the way back to the attraction. Now, oftentimes we think that, well, I can't control my thoughts. I can't control what I'm attracted to. You most certainly can. And so this, this virtue speaks directly to the, the depravity and the deviancy that is same-sex attraction. It's a disordered attraction. And so this virtue properly exercised temperance moderates a disordered attraction and will in fact negate it. And so one of the big hangups that we're seeing modernly is that people think, uh, they, they say that there's no such thing as reparative therapy. In other words, that, that one can't be quote cured of same sex attraction. The human will is indomitable and whatever it desires, it can achieve if it desires it purely. Let me say that again. The human will is indomitable and it can achieve whatever it desires provided it desires it purely and orders its life to it. It can also achieve or attain impure um, desires. But when we look at this, the, the virtue that moderates attraction to what are you attracted and do you moderate it? Do you regulate it? So part of what's here is is a, a concept called custody of the mind. I will think about this, only these things. I will not think about those things. And I will think about these things only in the time allocated to think of them. This is monastic discipline when uh, the monk in prayer or reading, when the bell rings, if he's mid-sentence, he stops on the word. He doesn't finish the sentence. And so it's the, it's the uh, primacy of obedience and it's the primacy of self-discipline that allows one to moderate attraction and desire. So the pleasure and the seeking of pleasure is secondary, we see in this virtue. So it's not enough to moderate behavior. One must moderate the desire and rightly order the desire. Many people who are involved in addiction and in addiction therapy will understand what I'm talking about. And we find the same thing um, in various practices and various things is it, you do not break the vice. You do not um, find moderation by simply choosing something that is socially acceptable. In other words, um, if, if I have an, an addiction for an illicit drug, then I'm not cured of addiction if I adopt or set, substitute the use of a legal drug. Um, so you can't substitute a socially or legally uh, behave, uh, acceptable behavior for one which is not and claim to be cured. So the fanatic 
um, the Satanist who is a fanatic about right and ritual and Satanism and converts to Catholicism and has the same disordered religiosity, um, he's still going to be open to what he's doing is better than what he was doing before, but it will ultimately be um, uh, a point of vulnerability for him. So it moderates attraction and the desire for pleasure and provides balance in the use of created goods. Balance in the use of created goods. So what we're talking about is when do we do things that we know are wrong, but justify them? This is a dangerous area where we justify vice or we justify sin. And it starts out with the Luciferian language you deserve. So we had a bad day at work. So you, you really deserve to eat that half gallon of bluebell ice cream. Um, someone said something uh, ugly to you. So you really deserve um, that larger Coca-Cola. Someone said something, did something, cut you off in traffic. Um, you deserve to vent. Uh, you deserve that. You see where we come come to modernly with this is, is it's, a, it's a broad avenue that leads us into all kinds of sin. So let's talk about, last week we introduced the concept of talking about the um, mother virtue. So the mother virtue is temperance, the virtue that moderates attraction and desire for pleasure and provides balance in the use of created goods. So let's look at her daughters. Let's look at those virtues, those habits, those that open us, that dispose us to grace. And the first one is going to strike our modern ear um, in a discordant way because we don't think of it as a virtue. And it's shame, the virtue of shame. And so the, the other side of that is to be shameless. And so what is shame? Shame is the distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or disordered behavior. Many people will say it's, it's a feeling of guilt. Shame is different than guilt. I had a wonderful, I had a great aunt, my grandmother's sister, who was my English teacher, and she had an interesting observation. She said, two different words can't mean the same thing, otherwise they would be the same word. Just simply the fact that they're not the same word means that they do not mean the same thing. I always like that simple country logic. So shame is distress caused by the consciousness of wrong. So it's an interesting thing. We talked about this briefly. We brushed up on it in prudence, but people want to say, when did your guardian angel speak to you? And when is it your interior? How can you tell? So the consciousness of wrong, is it the consciousness of a natural disorder of the natural law, or is it a consciousness of the disorder or wrong of an article of faith, an element of our faith, an element of ecclesial law, and then the disordered behavior should have the prick of conscience. When you, when you disrespect your father, when you disrespect your mother, this is against the natural law. And so the natural law is essentially enumerated in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And so the Ten Commandments will show you the bridge between natural law, that which we know naturally to be wrong or disordered, and ecclesial law or divine positive law, which is enumerated in the Ten Commandments and then flows from those, uh, from those edicts or those uh, articulations. Now, those articulations essentially will also find an echo or a bedrock in the, in the natural law. So shame is the distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or disordered behavior. If we lose this, if we lose this sense of shame, this, this, it's a numbness of conscience. And how can you lose this? You lose it through habitual mortal sin. You through, lose it through engaging in habitual mortal sin or constantly denying our Lord, be militating against elements of the faith, beginning to deform others and numb the conscience so that the behavior has to be so egregious, so outrageous, so depraved to prick your conscience um, that you're well past, um, that, that you're well past um, 
a simple course correction, it will require radical change. So shame is actually the understanding and in, in consciousness of wrong or disordered behavior and then to experience distress. Many of us are conscious of wrong or disordered behavior, but we do not have the accompanying distress. This is something that we should look at in our own spirituality. Do we have a hardness of heart towards certain individuals? Do we have a obstinacy? Do we uh, pray for them as we should? Do we have a darkness in our heart toward this particular individual who is engaged in wrong or disordered behavior, but we feel no shame? Shame is, is a shadow of the understanding of the damage done to the mystical body of Christ. And so it, it, it's shameful that some humans, no matter what they profess, that, that human behavior can descend into the animalistic, into cruelty. Um, man is, man's cruelty to man knows no bounds. Um, and so we should feel shame, distress caused by the consciousness of this wrong. Horror movies, any movie which glorifies, aggrandizes, or makes a, a central point of the desecration of flesh erodes and abrades our sense of shame until it's overstimulated and then it no longer works. For instance, if you were to ask a room full of people in, eight, in 1890, how many of you have seen a dead body? you would probably get the exact same number of hands if you ask the question in 2021. But the ones in 1890 would have seen death differently. It may have been the death of an infant. The death of a loved one is what calls to mind. But modernly, it's a violent death, one that is desecration of the corpus, um, these type of things that diminish human dignity, the dignity of the human body. And so we become numb to it um, as, a, as a people, as a society. And that's how life loses value. So number two, the second daughter is honesty. The habit of always seeking to do what is virtuous in each situation may also be called integrity. My grandfather used to define integrity as doing the right thing when no one's looking. And so Integrity is, is um, something that is very, very lacking modernly. It's something that is, um, that's lacking. It's something to, that needs to be um, fostered. It needs to be encouraged. Another way to look at integrity, if you talk to uh, an engineer or a military man or someone along those lines, is integrity is the constancy, the perfection of a surface, of an appearance, of a wall, of a line of defense. And so if there's a breach in that, there's a breach in the integrity. And so it is this understanding that we must be, we must have integrity in all areas, not just in some. The third daughter, abstinence refraining from the eating of certain kinds of foods. Now we used abstinence, this is geared toward religious at the time this was written, and so that was the audience. But abstinence can also uh, apply to other things. Refraining from the eating of certain kinds of foods and then fasting right below it, refraining from eating food in general. And so I wanna have a couple of comments with those. And so remember that we're under temperance, the virtue that moderates attraction. And so the value of fasting and abstinence is to mortify the flesh, is to, to place the flesh in a subjective role to the soul. If we follow the pleasures of the flesh, then the, the soul becomes held hostage uh, in this flesh that's pursuing pleasure or the unmoderated use of created goods. If, however, through mortification, we can subdue the flesh and right order attraction and desire for the things of the flesh, then the soul becomes the master of the flesh. The flesh serves the soul rather than holding it hostage. And I think that's a good way to look at it. 
Now, with regard to abstinence, many people still observe the rules of, of fasting and abstinence um, just to, to call to mind. So I'll tell you three little uh, vignettes or stories that um, the, um, the, the college students like when we're talking about fasting and abstinence. First of all, St. Paul talks about this as well, fasting. If you fast publicly, you have your own reward. If you're, if you're telling people, oh, no, thank you, I'm, I'm fasting, um, or I've been fasting for three days, then the merit is severely diminished in that. Now, with regard to abstinence, if I do not eat fish on Friday all the day craving a cheeseburger, then it hasn't really accomplished the goal. And so abstinence is, to, is done to moderate the desire. And so it's to be, abstinence and fasting are externals designed to create, to affect the internal, meaning they're the doing without to, um, to address the craving, if you will, or the body's desire, the corporal desire uh, for food, uh, for certain kinds of food. And so why do Catholics eat fish on Friday? Here's the departure. And so here's the three stories. One is that um, the house of Zebedee, the fishmongers, um, John was, um, was known to Annas and Caiaphas. We see this at the scene in the courtyard of Annas where Peter is being uh, present. But the gatekeeper knew him. Why did she know him? She knew him because he delivered fish to the priestly class. Um, and so fresh, fresh fish from the Sea of Galilee, um, th they were fishmongers. This is what they did. This is how they sold their catch. And so once all the apostles um, become apostles and profess the Christ, then the house of Zebedee loses many employees. It uses, loses Peter and Andrew, James and John, their accountant, Philip. And so they lose a big part of their workforce. But they were actually blacklisted by the priestly class, which said, you may not buy fish from them. So the, um, so the uh, Christians, the early Christians on Friday would eat what was left from the week's catch uh, out of solidarity and support for this family who had given all its workers and its sons uh, to this Christian movement. So there's one story. Uh, the second story is that we eat um, fish is not considered flesh meat. It's not considered carne because it's, it's, it's not um, a terrarium. And so the, the uh, abstinence, the declaration of abstinence for flesh meat in honor of our Lord's sacred flesh, which went through such outrage and perversion through the scourging and the, and the, the sacrifice on the cross. And so that was, that's another reason why it is um, that we don't eat fish on Fridays. Um, and then the other one is that many Catholics hold to an older school tradition of absolute fasting with the idea that there's no way the bless in solidarity with the blessed, blessed mother, because there's no way the blessed mother could have eaten anything on this day that they kill her son, that they scourge him, that they crucify him. And then he's taken from the cross, laid in her hands and put in the tomb. Food is far from her mind. And if you do this hard fast for any of these three reasons or for all three of these reasons, Friday truly becomes the memorial of our Lord's sacrifice of every day is, is Friday. Every day is the day um, that he was crucified. And so for those reasons, we see uh, these practices. Number five, sobriety, the virtue by which one has moderated use of alcohol. It expands beyond alcohol. And I'll point to the scripture precisely, or more precisely in the fifth chapter of Peter, when Peter says, be sober and alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling like a roaring lion, looking for a soul to devour. And so what he's talking about, he says two things, be sober and be alert. Be sober, meaning be unaffected by your appetites, by your desires, by your, your condition. Um, are you affected 
Um, we make poor decisions when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're alone, when we're cold, when we're hot. We, we're not very reliable creatures because we're easily affected. Our intellect is easily afflict, affected from the externals. And so what he's saying was be sober, be unaffected, and be alert, be watchful. And so these are the two qualities that St. Peter says one must maintain um, in, the, in the face of the adversary, in the presence of the adversary. The next one is continence. The virtue, this one is placed precisely in the will. Continence is the virtue in the will by one by which one remains steadfast despite the tumult of the appetites. And so St. Thomas is using appetites here as desires, passions, those things which move us. How hard is this to do? How hard is this to do? Um, I, I can think I'm being pretty steadfast until I smell the burritos halfway through mass. Uh, that they're going to serve out, that the knights are going to sell after the mass or the pancakes or whatever it is. And, and uh, one little whiff and, and suddenly my countenance is, is pretty rocked uh, because I'm thinking about things that aren't requisite with the mass. And so this brings up another point is that we, vice will enter through the five gates, one of the five gates, one of the five senses so imagine your body as a sovereignty, uh, as a walled city. Well, the, the senses are the gates. What we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell. Those are the gates, what we feel. Those are the gates through which the adversary uh, will enter and we'll let him in. And so this is where the attraction and desire now becomes action. And so rightly ordered we have to uh, we have to maintain the integrity of our gates chastity the virtue which moderates the pleasures of the senses in relation to those matters pertaining to the sixth commandment wow this one gets lots of discussion among the college students because they're all guaranteeing you that no one none of them are looking at married women after all the sixth commandment, the commandment against adultery, it deals with uh, married women, right? Wrong. What does that mean, adultery? The sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you will recall, when our Lord is speaking about pornography and masturbation, which he does directly in the Gospel of Matthew, um, many of you may not recognize it, but I'll I'll go through it for you. And so our Lord says, if a man looks upon a woman with lust in his heart, I tell you that he has committed adultery. The Lord didn't say a married woman. Here's where our Lord is, un, is, is trying to, to get us to engage in moral theology from a virtue standpoint. Every single woman, every woman, I shouldn't use the adjective single. Every individual woman, whether she is married or not, is covered by the sacrament or should be covered by the sacrament of matrimony as either a daughter, a wife, or a widow. Very simple. So for a man to look upon a woman, any woman, with lust is a violation of that sacrament of marriage. She's either a daughter, a wife, or a widow. Very simply, she's a daughter, she's a wife, she's a widow. If she is out from under that protection, then you still have the obligation to view her as if she were because it is her sin which may have taken her out of the protection. Do not let your sin be compounded on hers. Men do not think this way. People do not think this way. But our Lord was very clear. He said, if a man looks upon a woman with lust in, her, in his heart, he has committed adultery. Very next passage, he says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Better that you should enter Gehenna, missing these members. Listen to the language. Did he not just describe um, pornography and the link to masturbation, the length of self-harm? Did he not just describe that? 
I think he did. Um, chastity is the virtue which moderates the pleasures of the senses in relation to the matters pertaining to the sixth commandment. This is, this is so very important for us to get our heads wrapped around as to who we are, as to what is our obligation as a man, as a woman, as those who are stewards of procreation. And so this brings us to the next one, which is virginity. We define virginity modernly as a biological, physical state, a physiological state. St. Thomas is very clear that it is not. Virginity is the habit of the mind or soul, which always, listen to that, always refrains from taking delight, even interiorly, from pleasures associated with the sixth commandment. I will tell you that there's a multitude of men and women who are biologically virginal, but spiritually they are promiscuous. The habit of mind or soul, which always refrains from taking delight, even interiorly from pleasures associated with the sixth commandment. Now you get a look, a clearer look at when people talk about same sex attraction or even heterosexual attraction. It can't, it can't lead to delight. It can't lead to an altered state. It can't lead to uh, an obs obsession. This is something that, that we really need to, to teach and teach well. Um, theology of the body, St. John Paul II in his Theology of the Body talks about this, um, this moderation of, of desire, this purity of desire. And sadly, what happens is that we do not know how to be uh, friends. We, we do not know how to have a right ordered relationship with members of the opposite sex because of the, the prevalence of sexual uh, expression. Um, and so this is a very, very important set of daughter virtues that we, that we do well to, to become familiar with. Number nine, clemency or meekness, moderation in the delight of vindication or anger. This one, this one we don't often, we don't often recognize these opportunities because we think it's justice. It is not. When the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, He's saying this out of mercy to us, meaning if we engage in vengeance, it will be destructive to us. We can't engage in, in acts of vengeance without the harm being visited upon us in a spiritual way. We may inflict corporal damage. We may infl inflict psychological damage. We may even inflict spiritual damage. All of these we will answer for at particular judgment. But there must be no delight in vindication. There must be no delight or even desire. For those of you who are praying the Auxilium Christianorum, Friday is such a tough day. It's the litany of humility. And in the litany of humility, this is where you really take stock of where I am in a, in a sense of temperance. Um, you know, deliver me from the desire of being consulted. De deliver me from the desire of being loved. My goodness, this is, this is tough. It's really tough. But clemency comes out of, and meekness come out of a position of power. Clemency and meekness is not capitulation. It's not saying, oh, it's okay. It's not letting it go. It's understanding the severity of the transgression and not desiring vindication. It's understanding that when we are accused, when we are falsely accused, or even when we're righteously accused, our innocence is not dependent upon someone else's guilt. Our innocence is not dependent upon someone else's guilt. So the next one, modesty, modesty proper, the virtue in which one's externals do not draw others into sins against the sixth and ninth commandments. 
Wow. Well, this is the time of year where we don't have to worry about it so much, but dresses, which are decalogue, which have sundresses, these things that for whom and for what are you dressing? Men, for whom and for what are you dressing? Modesty, are, when Our Lady appeared to the shepherd children in Fatima, who were most modestly dressed, she was not, she was not um, chastising them or speaking to them. They were most modestly dressed, but she, she made it a point to talk to them about the issues with regard to modesty. Now, with regard to modesty proper, the virtue in which one's externals do not draw others into sin against the sixth and ninth commandment. We are much too familiar. We are much too familiar in our language, uh, with each other. And if we're familiar in our behavior, we're, we're too familiar in our thoughts. Are you affording someone the dignity to behave? Do you call them to a higher behavior? Um, and so modesty proper is one of the things that is, is absolutely missing in modern society. Uh, Father and I used to, to do a, uh, had a discussion. Fashion is decided by two demons who live in a cheap apartment somewhere on Fifth Avenue and they double dog dare each other and they say, I bet you can't get them to wear those ugly hip huggers like you did in the 70s. And the other guy goes, bet I can. Sure enough, there it is. So there's these two demons who are betting each other what they can get us to do. What, they can get us to wear and call it fashion. Um, just a little aside. But we have departed functionality and we've departed modesty. Number 11, humility. The willingness to live in accordance with the truth. Refrain of the irascible appetite from striving for excellence beyond one's state. Not judging oneself greater than he is. So there's three parts to humility. Humility, virtus, middle, on either side of humility, we'll use it as an example, on either side of a virtue is a vice. And so for every virtue, there are two opposing vices. So with humility, on the one side, we, we can easily say that and see that arrogance or pride is um, a vice opposed to humility. But another, the other vice, is self-deprecation, false humility. And false humility more closely resembles humility than arrogance. And so what you'll find is a, another example, and we'll, we'll look at it under fortitude, is courage. And so the two ex extremes are cowardice and um, reckless behavior. Reckless behavior more close, closely resembling courage. But I want to spend a moment here on humility and speak about false humility or self-deprecation. And self-deprecation is actually a form of pride. And it, it diminishes our true identity. So to understand exactly who we are, the Blessed Mother sums this up in two sentences in which from anyone else, one would be arrogant and the other wouldn't be self-deprecating. But because she is speaking the truth, to live in accordance with the truth, she's absolutely humble. And those two statements we find in her response to Gabriel in, in the Magnificat. She says, all generations will call me blessed. Wow, what a statement. And she's absolutely right. Behold the handmaid, the lowly one of the Lord. And she's absolutely right. She who is the lowest is raised to the highest because she's willing to live in accordance with the truth. This understanding exactly who we are is something for which we strive. And I asked the students a question and I'll let you struggle with it as well. Is it possible to humiliate the humble man? Is it possible to humiliate the humble man? And the follow-up is, if one is not humble, is there any way to gain humility 
without humiliation. And so while it's an interesting wordplay, we do well to think, especially when we, um, we, we sense rejection or we sense accusation. Am I truly humble here? A am I truly humble? Or do I have a self image that I want to protect? Do I want to know why a superior is saying something or someone is saying something? Do I want to know why? Or am I simply willing to live in accordance with the truth, knowing that the truth will always out? Maybe not in our lifetime, but the truth will always come. Refraint of the irascible appetite from striving for excellence beyond one state. Excellence. So we're going to come up with this against this word used by St. Thomas in many, many ways. And what he's talking about is a perfection of one state. And I'll give you an example. We call our bishops excellency. Why do we do that? Because the, the episcopacy, the, the bishop is a perfection of priesthood. That's why he's called excellency. The cardinal is called eminence. A cardinal is not a greater perfection than bishop. It's an elevation of governance. And so the priesthood is perfected or reaches excellence in the bishop. And if he goes beyond, if he's elevated by a uh, to, to cardinal, he still retains the title bishop because that is a perfection of his priesthood. And so excellence is within one state. If, if I seek to go outside that, then I'm not restraining, I'm not regulating, I'm not holding in temperance the irascible appetite. The irascible appetite is that which... A, it's a desire to um, aggrandize ourself, to achieve beyond what we're supposed to. And a classic example would be, um, and I know this is way, way out there, but just use your imagination. Suppose a bishop wanted to act as a politician rather than a bishop. Well, this, this would indicate an inability to uh, regulate or to have temperance in the irascible appetite for self-aggrandizement beyond one's state. His state is priest, is perfected as a bishop. So I know it's a wild example, but it's the only one I could come up with. So not judging oneself greater than he is. And so you see this progression. First of all, there has to be this departure from the truth. Then there has to be the inability to refrain the irascible appetite. And then we judge ourselves as being greater than we are. You know, it's an amazing thing. It doesn't matter. Um, how great the man that dies, the sun comes up the next day. The sun comes up the next day. Biggest, most important rancher in the world, his cows had to be fed the next day. Greatest musician in the world, somebody else is playing the music. We are not near as important as we think we are. And at the same time, we're more important than we could ever know. But it's not with regard to corporal disposition, it's regard to the spiritual disposition. Eutrophalia. Now there's a word that rolls off the tongue and I know we've all used it this week. The virtue of right recreation. So when you talk about the virtue of right recreation, break apart the word. Let's cipher this word just like Jethro Bodine would cipher this word. Re means to do again, creation. So to recreate, to rejuvenate, to revitalize, we call all kinds of things recreation that aren't recreation. But to recreate means to, to recognize the need for communication with the creator and to return to our label use. What does that mean, label use? Many times we talk about drugs or other things as having an off-label use. I'm going to use it in a little bit of a different way. 
off-label use. And so let's say I have a screwdriver. It's used and it's labeled for extracting certain types of screws. If I use it as a hammer, that's an off-label use. And what will happen? I'll destroy the screwdriver. So the off-label use is when we use an object for something which it was not intended. So what is our label use as humans? Well, we're made in the image and likeness of God. I can tell by some of you here that the Baltimore Catechism is still rolling around in your head. What is your purpose? To know love, know love and serve him. That's your label. So when you're off label use, when we're not knowing him, when we're not loving him, when we're not serving him, when we're serving ourselves, or we're more fi fixated on other creatures than we are the creator, then we're engaged in an off label use and we will damage ourselves. So we need to recreate, recondition, reform. When's the last time we did that? How do we, how do you do it? Get outside and make God the focus. Go on a pilgrimage, go somewhere, but, but be pilgrims. Get back into creation and, and with the constant knowledge of God. Make him present totally present sportsmanship the virtue in which one regulates the pleasures specifically in relation to play or games competition especially among siblings is something you need we need to watch and be aware of competition directly uh, channeled is a very good motivation it's a good appetite it's a good um, passion to have, but you, you look at Cyril and Methodius, who are example of right ordered holy competition in which one desires the success of the other. Um, so often in sportsmanship, we want to beat someone. And what it amounts to is we should strive for excellence in ourselves. I grew up in a family that rodeoed, my boys rodeo, and I'm, I'm now going to junior rodeos with my grandsons. And within our family was always the idea of don't worry about beating anybody else. Don't beat yourself. You have the best run that you can possibly do, the best bronc ride, the best calf roping run, the best team, run, whatever it is, you make no mistakes. I had a grandfather who said practice is not getting something right. Practice is doing it till you no longer get it wrong. And so sportsmanship, love of the game, love of, of, the, uh, of the event. And if someone beats you, they beat you. Go and practice. I used to tie calves until late into the night and rope the dummy till late into the night. And there was a sign there in the barn that says, when you're not practicing, someone else is. And when you meet him, he will beat you. And so that's the understanding of virtue, of sportsmanship, and the someone else that you're going to meet is the adversary. Because he studies us, he's got book on us. Be the best that you can be. Reach excellence within yourself, within your station. And competition takes care of itself. Decorum, the virtue in which one's externals suits person and circumstances. When is the last time we heard decorum? When is the last time we put that word together when we saw the 60-year-old guy with his ball cap on backwards, his shirt untucked, baggy pants, tennis shoes, trying to act like his grandson? There's an absence of decorum. When is the last time we were cognizant of who we are to other people? We always talk about being comfortable, come as you are, these kind of things. I've worn the same suit and I hope to wear this for 15 years and I hope to wear it until I die because I really want the Lord to recognize me. <laughs> I, I don't want him to look at me as a stranger. So perhaps by wearing the same suit, it'll spark a memory. It's a bad joke. Anyway, the point being is decorum, the virtue in which one's externals suits the person and the circumstances. We have to be aware of who we are in the cosmos. We're son, we're brother, 
we're father, we're husband, we're grandfather. Number 15, silence. The virtue by which one does not speak unless spoken, uh, unless necessary. Also the virtue in which one seeks to have interior quiet of the appetites. So all of us have uh, the ability to be uh, loudly silent. We can sigh with the best of them. We can clear our throat with the best of them. We didn't say anything, but we didn't have to. It's the interior quiet of the appetites. It's the interior quiet from which peace pervades. It was the Blessed Mother's in quiet interior. She led a life that was tumultuous. She was constantly being uprooted, moving here, there. Um, she has a son to raise on her own for part of the time. She, she is anything but stable in her life, but everyone wants her peace. So that came from the interior. St. Joseph, even more silent. St. Joseph, we, we don't have a quote from St. Joseph. He is that just, he is that strong a presence. Silence is a very masculine attribute by which one guides, by which one affirms. I can remember very, very well the first time that I got to go and gather cattle with, with all the men. There were several of us horseback and we're coming, we're coming up close to the corrals with a big set of cattle and all of us are kind of coming together. And I was in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. And my father looked across in front of several men across a herd of cattle and made eye contact with me. He didn't have to say a thing. It was that you're in the right place doing the right thing. Just keep doing it. We have to, to allow each other to be subtle. We have to be able to read each other and to give to each other the benefit of silence. Some of you know my wife, Valerie. She's very quiet. She's very virtuous. We will spend hours together in a vehicle driving and there's no music. They're just, and we, we've done this for 40 years of marriage. It's just the intimacy of silent communication the intimacy of compatibility of wills. To, to have a friend that allows you to be silent and to be that friend is a great virtue. Number 16, studiosity, the virtue in which one pursues knowledge according to one's state in life. Studiosity. Now we're gonna go down into the vices, the naughty nieces here in a minute. But studiosity is the virtue, curiosity is the vice. Studiosity is the virtue which pursues knowledge according to one's state in life. What is one's state in life? So if this is written for the monastic and he's reading this, his state in life is to be in subjection to uh, the right authority, to the abbot. And so he's only gonna study what he's given to study. We should only study what we are given to study. How often, if we put a counter or we put a tracer on the internet, we got no business knowing this stuff and it's not going to do us any good. The virtue in which one pursues knowledge according to one's state in life. There are lots of things that I don't have any reason to know about. The other side of that is there are many things which I need to know more about. Chief of them is about our Lord, about sacred scripture, about our faith, because these are the things that are gonna help me navigate the spiritual life. And that leads us to 17, the last daughter of, of temperance. And temperance has quite a few daughters because temperance, the virtue that moderates our attraction and our desires, it is in everything that we do or contemplate doing. And that is simplicity. The virtue in which one moderates one's externals to quantity, having neither more than is necessary nor less. Wow. How to be simple. 
how to be simple. Many of us were simple because we were poor. When we, when we left college, you could put all of your uh, possessions in the backseat of a Volkswagen bug. Now you got to re rent a Beacon's van. What is the quality of life? What is the quality of life? It's always amazing to me when and I know quite a few priests who have a vow of poverty and, and obedience and all of these things. They have these vows. And then when it's time to move, it's like a family of eight. They've got stuff. We've all got too much stuff. The virtue which moderates one's externals as to quantity, having neither more than is necessary nor less. I can remember very, very well. My grandfather had two coats and he was not a poor man. He had a work coat and he had a church coat. It's what he had. The work coat wore out, you buy a new work coat. Me, I got a pile of jackets. I got a pile of shoes and boots. I got, I got stuff that I'm not ever going to wear out. I got too much stuff. I am not a simple person as much as I would like to be. But it spills over into other things. The virtue in which one moderates one's externals as to quantity, having neither more than is necessary nor less. So that concludes the daughters of temperance. Now, before we go into the vices, I want to draw your attention to the faculties of the human person chart. That's this handout. And so let's go through this and spend some time with the faculties of the human person in light of temperance. And so if you'll look on the left side of your page, you'll see there are two, um, it says Catholic, and down at the bottom it says pagan, and then you've got two opposing arrows. So what that means is, is if you go down from top left to bottom right, the Catholic properly ordered is intellect, will, memory, emotion, appetite, instinct in descending order. Meaning, the intellect, where truth resides, controls the will, and the memory, emotion, appetite, and lower faculties are at the service and rightly ordered to the upper faculties. In the pagan, the bottom, the instinct, preservation of corpus, self-preservation, that is the primary motivator. And then he lives for pleasure, he lives for self-preservation, and then he's ordered from the bottom up. I will tell you that we live in a neo-pagan society because you will hear the phrase, you have to look out for number one. If I say to you, you have to look out for number one, I'm gonna ask you, show of hands, point to number one. Go ahead, point to number one. I'm not seeing anybody pointing. Good, excellent, excellent. You are Catholic. That is number one. The pagan will point number one. All of this is reflected in the difference between Lucifer's response to God and Mary's response to God. Mary says, be it done unto me according to thy word. And Lucifer says, be it done unto me according to my word. So this idea of looking out for number one, preservation of the corpus, um, pleasure and the pursuit of pleasures, and then emotional consolation, you see it works up. And what happens is the intellect and will are suppressed and the appetites are inverted. I mean, the, the faculties are inverted. You hear this modernly when people say um, about a decision, I feel like I should do so-and-so. This is not a good decision because it's made out of a lower faculty. When we feel instead of think, St. Thomas would call us insane, meaning we're disordered. The faculties of the human person are not working in right order. So what is right order? Right order places the intellect at the primacy, at the top, and then the will. Now, if you'll notice, there's a lot of moving parts on this chart. The intellect and the will are faculties which are reserved to the soul. They are faculties which are reserved to the soul. 
meaning it is the intellect and will which differentiates us from the animals. There are, there are a faculty of the eternal uh, soul, the olam, that, that which makes us different, that which is uniquely um, human. And so the intellect is where truth and reality reside. Truth and reality are Jesus the Christ and God the Father. So these are where truth and reality reside. Our understanding that this is true north is that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the central truth to which we must order our intellect. And then everything else has to flow from that. And so the, we'll just go down uh, through here quickly. The intellect is truth and reality. All right, technology works until it doesn't. <laughs> and so with regard to the faculties of the human person, where we were with this is that as you work your way down the chart from intellect to will to memory, you'll notice that there's a triangle and it says demon access in the shaded area. And you see how that gets darker toward the bottom of your page. But in that triangle area, these are the faculties which have an organic component. What do I mean by that? It means that there's a tangibility, there's a physical presence, there is a presence in our flesh. The diabolical can attack our flesh, but they cannot attack our soul directly. So in order to cloud the, the intellect and comprise and compromise the will, they have to work through the lower faculties. So for instance, it's easy to demonstrate that memory has an organic or a physiological, physical component. Because in a brain injury, someone may lose their memory. Uh, they may lose certain memories. Um, so that tells us that there was a, they were stored in a physical place and then the injury of the brain uh, disrupts memory. And so what happens is we can, um, just like any part of our body, it bears the marks of its use, of its sin, if you will. And so if we choose to always go back to a memory and, and have it um, and, and look at the negative aspect of it, then uh, it becomes a negative, very negative memory. It becomes a detrimental memory. By the same token, we can also color a memory with nostalgia or fondness when we talk, when we don't see uh, some of the adversity uh, or don't recall some of those things. We only re recall the positive things about a particular event. And so what right ordered memory calls us to do is to conform the memory to Thanksgiving. All, all experience is providential. And it has, has to have an element of thanks, thanks be to God even when it appears to be uh, detrimental, it appears to be traumatic or violent. And so the memory is a lot like a filing system, is that every time we pull up forward a memory or we recall something, we recall it with an emotional overview. I'll give you a good example. And so go into your head and close your eyes and go into your, into your memory and retrieve a 10-year-old memory something that happened when you were 10. Now separate the emotion from the memory. It's almost impossible. And so there's a cross-filing system within us, within our psychology that, that is called the emotion-memory interface or the emotion-memory linkage. So that emotionally, if, we're, if we uh, react in a, in a negative way, then immediately all the memories that are requisite with uh, our having cried before uh, come forward. Or so you, you get this understanding of the cross filing system that we develop within ourselves. Now if we're constantly bringing forward a memory and in light of a particular emotion, then the cross filing um, becomes cemented, it becomes fixed. 
this is what happens when people tell their story, talk about all the bad things that happened to them, when people vent, when they engage in, in unmitigated anger, unmoderated anger, or any unmoderated emotion, then the memory requisite with that emotion or and the mo emotion requisite with the memory become disordered. And so it's very hard to temper our uh, memories. Our, and, and so what happens in the post person, and this word I'm about to use is no longer politically correct, but in the hysterical person, in the histrionic person, what happens is the emotion takes over. And so just the mention of a particular event or the mention of a particular person drives them into histrionics. And so if the demon can figure this out, that you lack this virtue, uh, especially with regard to the ordering of the faculties of the human person, if your faculties are disordered, then he can be present directly to this because he can be present to the flesh. And so what we found is, is in, a, in many of these cases that we work, in possession cases, especially the memory, people cannot trust their memory. They simply cannot because the, the demon is in there messing around with that, for lack of a better term. I know that's not a real clear theological term, but the demon is in there because he can be in there and because there's a psychological compatibility of the human. So this disorders that emotion. Now the appetites are desires. This is a very simplified schema of St. Thomas's understanding of the faculties of the human person, but it's functional nonetheless. And so the desires, when it says hunger, thirst, ambition, it means more from a passionate sense, not the body hungering and thirsting, but, but what do we really desire? What is what is the thing that drives us? What is the, um, the overriding passion, the appetite that drives us? And then the instinct is preservation of the corpus or self-preservation. And so trust begins in this instinct. And so I'll give you a classic example of the perfectly ordered person whose faculties are absolutely ordered. And the example that I will use in, a partic in this particular case is um, Agnes, St. Agnes. If you know the story, St. Agnes is a young child and the shackles would not contain her. She was being martyred. And the shackles would not contain her, but she stood stock still, even though the shackles fell from her arms because they were too big. And she guided the executioner's sword to her neck, trembling as he was. And so what this amounts to is she's perfectly ordered that the instinct, which is preservation of the corpus, which yells, run away, save yourself, is in absolute subjection to the intellect, which knows that this life is not the only life. That to die in this life means to live with Christ. And so that's something that has to be known in the intellect. And then it comes down through the will, the memory, the emotion, the appetite, and suppresses this instinct. Maria Goretti, all of those that were martyred. Um, Miguel Pro shouting, Viva Cristo Rey. And in the moment that he's doing that, each one of them are reliving the passion. Because if you freeze frame Friday afternoon, good Friday afternoon at three o'clock, it appears that the demon has won and that God is dead. And so it's that understanding of absolute truth of the resurrection, uh, the way, the truth, and the life. It is that ordering of our faculties to that absolute truth. Now let's go back up and pick up some of the examples. And so the, doc, the dogmas, doctrines and dogmas of the Catholic Church help us to order our understanding and our intellect to the absolute truths. They're not opinions. The four Marian dogmas, mother of God, perpetual virginity, immaculate conception, assumption. These are not suggestions. These are not speculative theology. These are incontrovertible truths. The truth of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
these are incontrovertible truths to which we must order our life. Then we order our will, our memory, our emotion, our appetite, and our instinct to all of these. One of the a good example of reordering things in light of, of God is how many of us have lost a loved one, lost a job, there's been some calamity, and it was the worst thing that possibly could have happened. We didn't know how we were going to get through it. Six months later, we're saying things like it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's the same event, and that's reordered in light of thanksgiving. That's reordered in light of the absolute truth, which is God is a merciful God, and everything that he allows has a salvific purpose. We can turn away from God. We can blame God. And in, in doing that, we disorder the memory. We foster this anger at God. And this rage begins to take over. And it clouds our emotion. The person who has learned how to reorder the faculties in light of from the top down, it's much easier for them to practice virtue. I shouldn't say easier. Um, it's, it's much more um, efficacious when they practice virtue and virtue becomes more the norm rather than the exception. If we're constantly aware of God, if we're constantly aware of our desire to, to pursue him in all things, then we order those, those faculties. So will is the response to the event. I choose how I'm going to react. In much of the society of the sorrowful mother, a lot of what we do is deal with possession cases. And there are two big shifts in the will that have to happen if someone is going to be liberated. Also, if someone's going to reach sanctity, regardless of whether or not there's a diabolical element. And those two shifts, the first one is there has to be a shift from asking, why is this happening to me, to how can I use it for my salvation and the salvation of others? That is in the will. That is absolutely in the will, is that shift, that dispositional personality shift. And the second thing that happens in the will is to order it to the upper faculty and, and to say, I will do this. And so we often talk about repentance and metanoia. Repentance is, a, is in the intellect. It is the realization that I can't keep doing what I'm doing. I'm far from God. I'm not reconciled with God. That's repentance. And then metanoia is the movement in the will. Let me put it another way. Intellectually, I know I should lose 20 pounds. But until I move in my will by eating less and or exercising, I'm not going to achieve it. And so the intellect, what the, the pure truth, the absolute truth in the intellect only becomes manifest through an act of the will. And so it's, that's the response to the event. Another thing that we make the differentiation on with regard to response to the event is trauma. We often talk about that was a traumatic event or that they had a traumatic event or there, this was trauma. I would like to introduce to you the difference in the concept of trauma and violence. Trauma is the person's reaction to the event because oftentimes they can be traumatized by what someone says and there's no violence involved. It's all interior. The, the, the trauma to, being traumatized is a person's reaction to a, to a particular event. I'll give you a good example is the passion. Always take these things back to the passion. My question is, it, there's no question that what happened to Jesus was violent. The question is, was, did it traumatize him? Meaning, did it have a lasting psychological and physical effect? And the answer is no, it was not traumatic in that, by using that definition, that psychological definition, because the resurrection. And so he's not tied back to the event. When he sees the apostles in the upper room, he does not say, where were you guys? Where were you? He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't even mention the crucifixion. He says, who sins you forgive or forgiven. Listen to that language. 
And so in that forgiveness, he releases himself from the event. He releases all of us and gives us the methodology to release ourselves from violent events without trauma. Trauma is a, is a psychological and or physiological artifact that exists after the violence over which we are still damaged. We, we are, are still, we're, we're disordered in some way. So if will is the response to the event, memory is the recollection to the event, and emotion is the reaction to the event. So you see, as we go down through here, memory is, how do I choose to recall the event? And then the emotion is, how do I choose to react? Do I react to the passion of the Christ? How do I react to that? It may vary on any given day. The recollection of the event, how do I recollect it? How do I recall it? How, what do I choose to focus on? Is the vantage point from Mary and St. John's vantage point looking up at the crucified Christ? Is it the vantage point of the good thief or the bad thief? Which person am I? And memory is perspective. It's how is this, rec this event being recalled? From what vantage point? Am I a victim? Am I a participant? Am I a perpetrator? Am I a sinner? Am I a saint? What am I in this scene? And we do well to purify our memory in light of thanksgiving. Memories become clouded when we're critical. They become purified when we're thankful. If everything, if any time we access the memory file starts first and foremost with, Lord, I, I give you thanks for the faculty of memory. I give you thanks for so many people are losing the faculty of memory. Lord, I thank you for this moment. Then whatever you choose to remember, whatever you choose to recall has a depth and a clarity that's, that's under the patina of thanksgiving versus the cloud of criticism. Emotion, reaction to the event. Now, pain, suffering to sorrow. I want to talk about this for just a moment because this is the best way to purify emotion. Why am I experiencing the emotion that I'm experiencing? And is it rightly ordered? First of all, is it moderated? All of us know people who have, who lack the ability to moderate their emotion. When they do that, they give up the higher faculties their judgment is clouded and until they settle themselves down until they come back into a point of psychological equilibrium they can't make good decisions and so this emotional tumult is is really something that we got to get a handle on um, modern we're an emotional people the, the news everything else is geared to elicit an emotional response rightly ordered or improperly ordered but I want to give you this reflection point and then we're going to go to questions. We're going to come back to the faculties of the human person chart next week, but I'm going to give you this reflection and then I'm going to encourage you to ask questions. And Kate, if you would text me the questions, then I can read them into the record because I don't have an audio. I'm not getting a uh, reaction. So, Pain to suffering to sorrow. So when we talk about an event being violent, let's talk about this from the standpoint of the event itself. Pain is the acute response. It is the immediate response to a perceived offense. Real or imagined, but pain is that acute breathtaking response. Suffering is pain with purpose. And then sorrow is glorified suffering. And so suffering is perfected pain. Sorrow is, is glorified suffering. So let's go through these. But a good example to look at this is that 
Look at the three persons at the foot of the cross. The three people at the foot of the cross that I draw your attention to are Mary Magdalene, our Blessed Mother, and St. John. In sacred art, Mary Magdalene is depicted in great travail, physical anguish, on the ground, wailing, and many sacred artists do not afford her the halo in this scene. She's yet to be a saint, and they do afford the halo to the Blessed Mother and to St. John, because Mary Magdalene's behavior is not sanctified or saintly behavior. Why? Mary Magdalene epitomizes pain. Pain is how does this affect me? How will this affect me? So Mary Magdalene is looking upon the Christ. She's looking upon her exorcist, the only man who has ever truly loved her, the man who saved her life, the man who purely loved her. And her relationship with Christ is a physical, a carnal relationship. Not that they had any kind of conjugal relationship, but it's, it's, it's a flesh-based relationship, meaning she bathes his hair, she anointed him, she um, touches his feet. And so there's that. So she's watching the corpus be destroyed. To, to accentuate this point, she fails to recognize him in the glorified form in his risen glorified body three days later. She thinks he's the gardener. She doesn't recognize him because she's looking for the corpus that she last saw. So Mary Magdalene is in pain in reaction to the event. That's how does this affect me? Now one can linger in, in pain indefinitely for the rest of one's life. One can linger in this pain. This is asking why is this happening? Pain is the voice that says, why is this happening? Now let's look at St. John who epitomizes suffering. Suffering is the pain turned into purpose. In the play, Murder in the Cathedral, the author places in the archbishop's mouth the phrase, Suffering is action. Suffering is action. And so while suffering is the understanding that I have to go through this, if any of you have ever gone to physical therapy or if you've ever had a broken bone, you realize that your life changes for a time and it may change forever, but it's a life changing and then it's ordering your life to this suffering, to this activity, for as long as God so deems. And so this is where we run off the rails in Catholic healing, especially in liberation and deliverance, is the Protestants define liberation or deliverance as the cessation of physical suffering. The Catholic doesn't do that. The Catholic realizes that it's recon healing is reconciliation, being reconciled with God. Healing is reconciliation with God the Father through the sacraments. And that may or may not alleviate the physical suffering. It certainly should allevi alleviate the pain because the pain is asking, why is this happening? Suffering is how can I use this? And then the application of the how. So St. John is the epitome of suffering because he is literally compassionate with our Lord, looking upon him with love, he who he loved purely with a virginal love and looking at him saying, you said you have to do this. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. You said you had to do this. Now you must do it. And I pray that you go through it with integrity, with honor and bringing glory to God. The Blessed Mother epitomizes suffering. Suffering is the understanding that whatever is happening is necessary in God's justice. Of all the three at the foot of the cross, she most clearly sees God the Father because she, no less than he, is giving her only son in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world and all of humanity. No greater love has this 
than God the Father and Mary the mother to give their only son so that we might have life everlasting. This is sorrow. This is the understanding that this is necessary in God's justice. This is necessary. And it's the only way that it can happen. So that's pain to suffering to sorrow. And our emotion has to be rightly ordered to that progression. Am I crying the hot tears of anger? Am I crying the hot tears of pain? Am I weeping the, the cleansing tears of suffering? Am I dry eyed with love for God the Father in the sorrow? In the Pieta, we see the epitome of sorrow. It's called the Pieta or the Pieta. Michelangelo named the image that because it's the height of piety. Piety meaning love of the Father, love of God the Father. Because in this moment, when she looks across his bro broken body at us, there is no more that he or she can give. To God the Father, for God the Father. And so that's pain to suffering to sorrow. Our emotion has to be rightly ordered to that truth. Then we're going to go deeper into that this next week. Um, and so we are at 20 till the top of the hour. Um, let me look here. I've got a text. Okay, I have finished with your reflection, and so Kate is saying, let's take five minutes to gather questions, and then we'll go back live. So let's do this at 15 till the top of the hour. At 15 till, we'll resume, and you will have text the questions to me, and I'll do my best to address them. Um, thank you. I'll rejoin you soon. Righteousness brighten or repulse those conditioned by by sin, and so to understand fright or fear, fear is the first rotten fruit of the fall. It's one of the first. Um, it's one of the first effects that we see. Um, God asked Adam, "Where are you?" And Adam's answer: "I was afraid." And so already communication with God is, is interrupted, is uh, affected. Uh, and so he's not answering the questions God's asking, but he's fearful. And so fear distorts. And so what happens is, is when a person with a distorted or deformed image is around, spiritual image, is around those with a, with a true image of God, then they realize or they see almost as in a mirror their own deviancy, their own deformity, their own depravity. And so it's not fearful as much as it is aversion, but they don't want to be around those people. And so what you'll find is that as you start to grow in holiness and desire sanctity, you, you will become repulsive to your family, uh, who is not on the same conversion curve or trajectory as you are. Other people will um, warm up to you. They will be much more friendly and outgoing because they're recognizing the Holy Spirit in you. And so um, your grandmother had an, an old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And she's precisely right. So the evil want to associate with the evil and the good want to associate with the good. Um, if sorrow is because of lies and deception of others, how can we say it is God's will? And so sorrow, if what we're feeling is not true sorrow unless we're understanding that it addresses God's justice. And so we may act as if we're sorrowful, but it's a passive form, it's a passive form of offense. Um, we're taking offense at the behavior of someone else. And St. John of the Cross, had a, uh, his quote was, who am I to be offended at the actions of anyone? And what he's saying is, is that our own actions are offensive enough. If we become uh, immersed in the actions of someone else, then we're off the mark. What we really need to look at is what is the motivation 
that precipitates uh, this action. And so shame is the distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or disordered behavior. Now, the sense of shame is a prick of our conscience. <clears throat> it shows us how to pray. It shows us with whom to associate, with whom not to associate. Understand, though, that if you're going to, and all of these are tied into this discussion on spiritual works of mercy, the first one is to spread the gospel message. And so you give, you've got to give someone the opportunity to do the right thing before you start being critical of them doing the wrong thing. Um, so what you're describing, if sorrow is because of lies and deception of others, that may be shame, it's not sorrow. And so words mean things. And so um, we really need to understand that sorrow is a, is a righteous reaction to the understanding that suffering is necessary, that God's holy will is, is at play, that everything has a salvific purpose. And for many people, it's going to be the hard way. It's not going to be uh, another way. What does the process of working on these virtues look like? Great question. First of all, it is the first thing that is, is to have pure desire, is to desire to grow in sanctifying uh, grace, to desire to be more pleasing to God, to desire to be virtuous, and then to go about looking for the opportunities to practice virtue. Look at every day, at every interaction with what can I what virtue can I build uh, in this moment, in this encounter? Um, and, and just start with the, the four cardinal ones, the, just the basics, and then you can get into the daughters. Um, but just the basic ones, uh, prudence, temperance, fortitude, um, and justice. And we'll go through all, as we go through all four of those, just remember their, their um, definition and try to talk and speak the language of virtue, think the language of virtue, try to be virtuous to and with one another. And, and there's some simple tests, is virtuous people, um, vice-filled people talk about the actions of others. Virtuous people talk about the actions of God. And so what is your focus? Is your focus on creature? That's gonna be an indicator of vice, or is your focus on creator? That's going to be an indication of a virtuous disposition. How does one know that a memory is affected by demons or the demonic? <clears throat> one is, uh, it's a great question. One of, the, one of the indicators, there are several, but one of the indicators is that um, the, there's, there's, no, there's nothing positive toward God toward Our Lady, uh, the Blessed Mother, toward our Lord. There's nothing positive. There's never a positive light within that memory. Um, there's always an accusatory element in the memory. Um, God doesn't care. God wasn't there. Jesus doesn't understand. The Blessed Mother's aloof, whatever it may be. But you look for that element that militates against the integrity of the Trinity, the identity of the Trinity, and the Blessed Mother. And so if that's there, then there's an indicator um, that it, that memory may be uh, being affected or clouded by the diabolical. My granddaughters wear ripped jeans with shredded open areas. Should this be addressed by their father? Is part of the instruct the ignorant done in silence by our actions, not lectures, etc.? We would all like to be St. Francis and preach the gospel every day, use words if necessary, but we're not saint and we're not Francis. So to instruct the ignorant, first of all, the ignorant would like, there has to be an openness to be instructed. Otherwise, then you skip straight to three, which is admonish the sinner. And so this is why the instructing of the ignorant starts not with pointing out their defects, but pointing out the Lord's attributes, our Lady's attributes, um, sharing the gospel message, sharing the, the treasures of the faith of the Catholic Church. If you skip to number three, which is admonishing the sinner, then you, you lose any grace to be gained in the first two. Um, so that's what I was saying is we, we tend to, to jump right in there at, at number three. In other words, make sure our behavior is demonstrating the virtue, etc., before lectures to another. Um, and it doesn't have to be lectures, just the quiet word. People, 
will want to, if, if you are a holy person, people will, they'll fall into two groups. Those who want to spend time around you and those who can't stand to be around you. Those who want to spend time around you, um, it, it's who you are more than what you say, which leads to conversion. However, what you say gives them um, not only food for thought, but it gives them a, a template or a matrix to think. It gives them a methodology to think. And, and that's why we talk about speaking the language of virtue and thinking the thoughts of virtue. Next question, how do we as friends or family member best guide those stuck in pain to move from pain to suffering to sorrow? I think that sharing that reflection of pain to suffering to sorrow and the understanding that you can stay in pain as long as you pick it. You know, your mother told you that if you pick it, it'll never heal. <laughs> and so um, as long as we pick it, as long as we vent, as we, long as we engage in uncharitable accusatory behavior toward either the perpetrator and or God for allowing it to happen, then there's not going to be any healing. And so it can be a raw, it can be a raw wound, it can be a, an apparent uh, gaping wound for as long as we choose to mess around in it. And so if it's going to, if it's going to heal, it's got to heal from the inside out. Um, and so all of those old cliches really had some, uh, really had some, some value. One of the things that we see often with modern psychology and even with uh, Protestant deliverance ministries and others unbound is a classic example that where this happens is there is a poultice of emotional consolation which sears the outside and emotional consolation is a counterfeit for spiritual consolation which will only come from reconciliation with God and so by telling the story being encouraged to vent and do these things and, and uh, then this poultice sears over the outside Meanwhile, uh, there's a there's a raging infection, and it will erupt at some point in time. Uh, at some point, it festers. So every bit of contagion, every bit of animosity against the other person or against God, every bit of uh, lack of charity, that wound has to be scrubbed down to the living blood, and it then heal from the outside. Uh, I mean, from the inside out. Um, therefore it, then it renders a glorified scar and at that moment it, it if you'll notice and I, this is a, a little re, another little reflection to leave you with is that all of the sacred art every single piece of sacred art that depicts the reckon, the resurrected christ none of them show the wounds of the scourging none of them none of them show the wounds the wounds that they show, the five sacred wounds, are the wounds of sacrifice, not sins of the flesh. They are the wounds of sacrifice. The five sacred wounds are the wounds of sacrifice, not the wounds of sin, not the wounds of, um, of the flesh. All of that passes away in the resurrection. And so what we get caught up on, the offenses are wounds of the flesh. What are our sacrifices? What is the marks of our sacrifice? Motherhood, fatherhood, right spousal union. Those are the marks of the sacrifice of vocation. And so at the end of the day, in the glorified body, the scars of sacrifice, the marks of sacrifice, that's what will be in the glorified body. Purgatory, it's a place for all of those artifacts of the sin, all the flesh artifacts of sin, all of the attachments to things of the world to be burned away, for the body to be purified, for the soul to be purified, so that it may ascend to God in that pure and glorified form. And so that's the last of the questions. If I do not have, I can't see a screen, um, and I'm not getting any more questions. So with that, I'm going to bid you adieu, and I will see you next Wednesday, same time, um, same place. Um, thanks be to God for this opportunity, and uh, I will see you then.